We're going to move on to a more congenial subject, maybe something of a two-wheel triumph when we're talking about biking in the city of New York. People have some things to celebrate, including this first slide I'm going to share with you right now. Protected bicycle lane implementation by calendar year from 2007 right up to 2016, this lovely slide provided to us by the Department of Transportation. You can see here on this small graph there, 0.8 bike miles protected lanes were added in 2007. Now, that's just under one mile back then, but every year there's been a little bit more progress and a little bit more. We went to 3.1 miles in 2008 that were brought online, and in 2009 some nine miles were added. Fast forward up to 2016, when we've got two and a half miles of protected lanes already completed, this big chunk in blue is the progress. The concrete's dry and the lane's going down. That's about 13.7 miles and 5.3 miles already in development there. So this would be a banner year for bringing protected bicycle lanes online, about 21 and a half more miles of protected bicycle lanes coming to the city across those five boroughs. Now, we've got all these protected bicycle lanes, but just who's riding? Next slide here, going to let you know about the number of cyclists according to a study commissioned by New York City's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Now, there are about uh, one million and a half New Yorkers who say that they ride their bikes to varying degrees of regularity. This largest number, the 49 percent there represented in blue, are folks who ride their bikes at least several times a month. That represents about 778,000 of the respondents. This 34 percent number is people who ride about mm, a few times a year, casual folks, and there is 17 percent, the lowest number, about 272,000 folks, said they ride their bikes at least once a month. Now, this is a great little section here. That means 25 percent of New Yorkers are getting out on their two wheels, but 75 percent of us, about 4.8 million residents of the city, rather take the train or a bus or a ferry, so they don't really bike at all. So this is a great picture to let you know that New York City is the fastest growing biking major city anywhere in the nation, which is great news. And I can let you know specifically in Brooklyn that our people who commute by bike to work has grown by 75 percent. So that's good news and something of a two-wheel triumph. Now let's get into the A block. <laughs> Brooklyn's Fourth Avenue stretches for six miles from Atlantic and Flatbush downtown to the Belt Parkway in Bay Ridge. It was paved way back in the 1890s and rebuilt in 1910 to accommodate more traffic. 100 years later, it's time for a little freshening up, but the redo may be slightly more contentious this time around. Part of City Council member Carlos Menchaca's district is served by Fourth Avenue, and he'd like his cycling constituents to have access to a protected bike lane. We want to welcome him to BK Live. Good to see you again, Carlos Menchaca. Thank you very much for being here, Carlos. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Brian. And Ted Wright is the Bicycle and Greenways Program Director at the New York City Department of Transportation's Traffic Planning and Management Division. It's a mouthful, it. but it's a big job. And thank you both for being here today. We appreciate it. So what is the problem getting this protected bike lane included in Fourth Avenue's makeover? Carlos, why don't we start with you? Well, I think one of the first things we have to we have to do is we have to sit with the data that you just presented, Brian. I think that there's uh, a lot more galvanized support for for bike lanes, but this is not uh, an easy. This is a very kind of complicated conversation to have in community boards. Out of CB7 um, in Sunset Park, you have real robust conversations, and what I think what, what I want to do is is basically say we're we're living in a time post Vision Zero. Um, we are also living in a time where traffic. Um, or I should say road improvements have been installed, uh, temporary looking improvements that have changed the way that we think about Fourth Avenue, which is which means that more bikes are using it, including myself, uh, to get to one part of the district to the other. So that, that I think, is part of the conversation as we think about uh, more improvements mm -hmm. um, coming along. And the last thing I want to say is that the conversation really was shaped um, by, uh, or in a time before Vision Zero, um, when these improvements were not were not installed, and so we're we're now trying to do the right thing on Fourth Avenue. Right, because I mean, anyone who knows Fourth Avenue knows it's like a highway. I mean, it can be like I ninety five trying to ride your bike on that. Uh, Ted, what are the challenges in trying to get a a bike lane on Fourth Avenue? It's a big challenge, like you said. Uh, we've we've installed all 
we have installed a lot of great improvements out there already, and we've seen a lot of benefits. There's been a heavy increase uh, in pedestrian safety. Saving that's happened. lives, literally. Saving lives. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, because 10, you mentioned 75%. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been a 75% jump since 2010 Brooklyn yeah. in Brooklyn cycling. I, I like to look at this as a real opportunity to start serving some of these new people, uh, not to pat ourselves on the back too much here, mm -hmm. but it's kind of great to see people asking for it. That said, these projects are huge. You know, Fourth Avenue, like you said, it's a highway. That's kind of just one concern. The other concern is the fact that the R train runs directly underneath it. You know, we can't just uh, change the curb lines willy-nilly, move all those utilities, move all that drainage. Um, it becomes very difficult. Uh, so we're, you know, I kind of echo what the council member is saying here is, you know, we need to hear this from the community and we need to look at what the real priorities are out there moving forward. So that's one of our questions, because it seems like, in a lot of headlines, it said it's a now or never thing, because if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, they're not going to tear up the street again to add a bike lane. But what considerations, besides the neighborhood outcry, if there is one, do you guys take into consideration? Because I'd never thought about, OK, yeah, the R train is under there. So there's infrastructure things. It's not as simple as maybe in some other places where you can do it. Right. I mean, the reality is the R train is a big part of it. Those medians that you see in the middle of the street, all they're not it's particularly not just by beautiful. Yeah, you know, it's not. We're not talking Park Avenue out there. Um, but adding things to those medians is is a conversation that we need to have, not only with electeds mm -hmm. and people in the neighborhood, but also with MTA, and that becomes very difficult. So. Uh, you know, right now, a lot of people see the extra space out there. They see the extra space in the roadway, and they're like, why can't it it's work? It's a no-brainer. Yeah. Right, it's a no-brainer. And I, I like the idea of exploring it. But that said, it, it's a complex conversation. Not only, a, I'll add a couple things here. Mm -hmm. It's not only a money thing. You know, this is a time thing. Capital projects, when they rip up a street, it takes a lot of time to rebuild them. So. That is a cost, you yeah. know, th that's a big cost to those businesses, to the people who've been out there advocating for pedestrian benefits. And we just need to make sure that all these people are on board and that we're, if we decide to go forward with this, we need to weigh all of the negatives as well. And I hate to be that guy, but that's, have that's to be a realist. Job. That's yeah. that long title coming into play. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's Honestly. why I want to be very thankful for the Department of Transportation that, that really kind of took this uh, not only seriously, but um, they're doing their own analysis about the changes of Fourth Avenue. Um, but what I also want to say is that, that you showed a video earlier, uh, a CB6 particular uh, video, about what happened recently with City Bike. And what we want to do is really open up this conversation in a way that's digestible to the community at every level to engage in this conversation so they can learn a little bit more about what's happening. We don't want this to be a, a, a comp too complicated for anyone to understand. Yeah. Every New Yorker should understand what's happening. Because if we can get this right, we can get a lot of other things right as we think about infrastructure that's changing, uh, including the expansion oh. of City Bike into Sunset Park. So um, has where happened yet? I know you guys have been servicing <laughs> has it happened the city's yet? No. bikes. But uh, but it but it will okay. um, and and that's really just out of out of the sheer uh, tenacity of the community. Um, we also welcome City Bike uh, as an employer in the district. They are the headquarters is in Sunset Park on Third Avenue. Uh, so so there's a lot of synergy there. And and again, when we think about this very unique space mm -hmm. uh, on Fourth Avenue, that's where I see a lot of City Bike infrastructure, or I should say, City Bike users using to get from Bay Ridge to downtown. So when and how do you see City Bike continuing to expand? I know I live in Park Slope thereabouts, and there's got to be at least 50 new City Bikes. Yeah. And yeah. they're all empty. Overnight. They're being used. Yeah, it does seem like overnight, which, you know, I congratulate you on that, because that seems to be a successful sort of expansion. However— Can I piggyback on that, just to throw all kinds of questions at you guys? There is a vocal <laughs> contingent of folks who say, enough already, too. They're stealing all these parking spaces, and how do we balance this between people who are just— going for a spin versus my real needs of living and unloading and my kids and my stroller and all that jazz. Right. So those voices. One for you, one for you. <laughs> you start on well, that one. <laughs> Give me some time. Here's what I'll say. I think, I think 
clearly the, the infrastructure is intimidating, uh, especially if you're on the side of, of protecting uh, parking spots. And so we hear that. Um, there's been robust conversations on the ground, but it doesn't mean that we can't do better. Um, and I think you're seeing a lot of that frustration in the community boards just days after. But we also know that communities that have enjoyed this uh, sentiment changes. Um, people see uh, um, safety um, uh, as a concern, and it's met with with this kind of infrastructure, both bike lanes, city bike, um, but also uh, there are more people riding city bikes than ever before. I'm a brand new member. I said I wouldn't become a member until I came to my district, and, and so now I am. I invite both of you to get on one, and we can maybe do a nice. maybe the four of us yeah, can do a do bike it. ride. Um, but <laughs> anyway, I, we we could do better at making sure that we get out to the people and do it in Spanish and Chinese. This is this this is a district. When I think about Absolutely. about any infrastructure, Structure, we got to do it in, in languages that make it accessible to everyone. So, Ted, what does the Department of Transportation think about city bike expansion? I, I mean, with, these are things that happen on city streets. You know, you move parking, you get pushback. Um, we did a very robust outreach plan. The reality is, you can't reach everybody. You go out there, once these things show up, that's going to affect people that never saw it before, yeah. and they're going to be the ones who are going to be angry. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that said, you know, I will say that there's a real benefit, like in, you know, one parking spot now, you can fit a whole bunch of bikes. So I encourage those people to get out there and use those bikes for those short trips in the neighborhood. The great part about Park Slope, a lot of those people are using their cars for short trips to go get groceries and such. Uh, what we've seen, car. yeah, what we've seen in other parts of the city is some of these trips are switching to bicycle, which is great. So does the Department of Transportation and your division specifically have some bent on getting rid of cars in the city? The uh, former uh, commissioner was called a zealot famously right. about bikes. So is that really the agenda? Are you trying to push for a car-free New York City? Absolutely not. We, you know, and this why isn't... not then? I, no. This is <laughs> this is this is one of those things you know it, it's it's which came first the chicken or the egg mm -hmm. problem you know I, to me we're responding to people out there every large U S city out there is seeing a huge growth in cycling this and is more a, than us right there's a there's a this is a generational thing so we're filling a need this is not us you know it, it, it's a trade off mm -hmm. we have to balance these things. I am completely empathetic. I drive sometimes. Um, Breaking news. In a car? <laughs> I, I, I drive sometimes. I actually enjoy it. But it, the reality is a, a bicycle is a lot more efficient. It allows me to park, you know, a lot closer to where I'm trying to go. Uh, those, All those short trips are just a lot easier. So, uh, and, and I think yeah. what, what else we, we need to be thinking about is, as we understand the needs, uh, you have a place like Red Hook, unlike Park Slope, right. um, that is starving for transportation alternatives, and City Bike is an alternative. Uh, we also have a, a large public housing community uh, that has a, a, a great discount, $5 a month, um, with an annual membership. Uh, go online and, and check it out. Uh, so we have, we have real responses to, I think, people's understanding of what this is, both parking spaces and that this is right. a, a, f a face of gentrification. And really what we're doing is, is addressing the need for alternatives to transportation, um, un not unlike ferry uh, and, and other bus services that we can bring into our communities. Maybe even streetcars. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. To be continued. Yes. yes. Carlos Menchaca, Ted Wright, thank you both very much for being here. I'll have to invite you back to talk more about this issue and others sometime soon. Thank you.